Union Square in the heart of San Francisco. It's The Cube, covering Spark Summit 2016. Brought to you by Databricks and IBM. Now, here are your hosts, John Walls and George Gilbert. Oh, welcome back to Spark Summit 2016. I'm John Walls here along with George Gilbert. We're in San Francisco here in the Hilton for the uh, second day of our coverage here of Spark Summit 2016. We're joined now by John Farlin, who is um, um, a technical consultant with a group called DNVGL, and they're really a, a consultancy that helps companies, in essence, mitigate risk in a lot of different uh, sectors, maritime, oil and gas, energy, just to name a few. John, thanks for being with us. We, yeah, we absolutely. appreciate it. Yeah, It's great. It sounds like a really cool job, frankly. Uh, yeah. George and I were talking about this before, uh, but you deal with the energy group. That's, that's your, your focus. So give us a little bit to our CUBE audience. This is your first time with us here on theCUBE. A little bit sure. more about what you do at uh, DNVGL and, and, and particularly within the energy group. Yeah, so uh, DNVGL, like you kind of mentioned, is a uh, large organization. It's got four pillars. Um, maritime, oil and gas, energy, and business assurance. We also have business units uh, for software, cybernetics, and research, but those are not our major bread and butter. So within those four pillars, I work in the energy business unit, and energy is obviously a hot topic all over the world right now. Um, and within energy, I work in a group called Policy Advisory and Research. So Policy Advisory Research is basically charged with uh, consulting and providing advisory services to utilities in the United States and internationally. Um, and so ba they basically ask us to solve some of the more difficult problems, or at least they ask us our thoughts on them. And then we go and say, all right, you know, uh, we've dealt with this problem in this part of the world, so here's the solution that we think that you should implement for whatever you're looking for. All right, and, 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 and so obviously uh, with energy especially, I'm thinking about um, you, consumption patterns, weather comes into play there, obviously. Um, you've got smart meters. Yep. You know, so you've got all, all these crazy inputs going on, right? Yeah, actually, and just, just half a second on that, I, I just got done with that talk, and uh, like, like I was just kind of saying, spent a little bit too much time going into the nitty gritty technical stuff, but one of, the, one of the cool things about my job is that electricity usage has a lot of things going on, a lot of things driving it. So what hour of the day it is, is I, like technology aside, what hour of the day it is is a huge driver of how much electricity you use. Also, what about the electricity you use, if it's 2 p.m. now, what about 2 p.m. yesterday? Because we're humans are very habitual people, we uh, have diurnal cycles, what I did yesterday at the same time pretty much predicts what I'm going to do today at the same time. So things like that. Temperature is a huge deal. We worry about things like heat buildup in buildings. So if you're trying to model how much electricity usage a structure is using, right, you have to account for, of course, what the outside atmospheric conditions are at at that time, but also what they were for the past few hours, because the heat builds up in a structure. And depending on how efficient that structure is at disseminating the heat, heat buildup or heating envelope, then you have to model that as well. There's so many complex drivers. It's, it's crazy to actually think about it. You don't, you, didn't, you don't realize it's as complicated as you think. So, so where are utilities then in the, in the big data game? Because they have a lot of opportunity, it seems like, as you said, they, they, they know what their user's doing. Yeah, I Better know. than anybody, right? Because that's their bread and butter. Yeah. So where are they in terms of putting that data to actual action and, and to, uh, whether it's conserving energy or delivering a better service, or whatever that experience might be? I think they're looking, they're looking for insights. They, I, don't, I think the, the, the ball's in uh, a lot of people's courts right now. The, we have not figured out exactly how to do that. And when I say we, I mean we're a consulting group. So we're actually, we talk to utilities all around the country, and the first thing is first, collecting the data. First thing is deploying a smart meter network. You know, back in the day, every, your meter would be read once a month. So that's 12 observations per household per year. All right, so now we're going to smart meters, and smart meters not only are connected with the internet, they record things at an hourly frequency. So now we went from 12 per year to 8,760, the number of hours in a year. Now, I mean, we're, we're talking about stuff, I have one client in particular that's talking about five second sampling frequencies, and not only just the household, every end use in the household, every light, every dishwasher. I, I had gotten involved in one um, sort of energy consumption project, and 
the thing that uh, the, the company that was sort of sponsoring this found out pretty quickly was that when you're just looking at the meter, you don't get a lot of granularity. You don't, you can't ask interesting questions. The instrumentation's too coarse. Right. But when you get to every device, that's right. when you can do things like the thermal envelope and right. you know what appliances run when, you know right. when, and I imagine the utilities might not have access to that because that would be an enormous expense. Yeah, I mean, think but, about it. Like Experian and some of those kind of credit organizations, oddly yeah. enough, have like demographic information on on folks, but utilities don't know a whole lot. You're exactly right. So how do you, you're not the utility, but you might have other avenues to get insta, into the instrument, that data in the home. Yeah, and so I think, I think you're absolutely right. And what end use metering kind of does is start to get, it chips away at the question of occupancy, human behavior within inside the house, right? So you can tell what the quantity of electricity usage was, but what drove that? Was it because it was really hot for the last three days? Or was it because you're having your cousin's birthday party and you have 20 people over? You, you don't know that unless you're kind of monitoring a little bit more granular information. Well, when you're advising utilities, have you gotten to the point where you can instrument the house with greater you know, granularity than just the meter? We're starting to, and that might actually just tie into why we're here in the first place. I mean, Spark, Spark is finally giving us the ability. Uh, we've made leaps and bounds, right? So the energy industry in general lags behind a lot of industries, years if not decades, right? Um, and so finally, now we have the reason to use something like Spark. Just like you're saying, we have all this data coming in. We need some way to like efficiently manage it and to analyze it and do the sort of you know, algorithms and models that have been legacy in the industry. The industry, trust me, the industry is a very advanced industry when it comes to analytics, mathematics, and that sort of thing. It's not advanced in dealing with large amounts of data and combining the analytics with it. So we know what we want to ask, more or less, for right now. We have data now that should allow us to answer the questions at a much broader level. And what I'm discovering now is that there are questions we didn't even know we wanted to ask because we're finally able to like, all right, let's look at it all. Let's look unknown. at it all. Rumsfeld's unknown unknowns. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You didn't even know. You didn't even know that you wanted to ask that question. So what's, what's getting you that information now? What, how are you collecting that? So let me, let me give a quick example. So uh, we were talking before about the peak. Everyone worries about the peak, rightly so. That is the one moment in time where electricity demand is greatest. So typically it's in the summer, the hottest day of the summer, three o'clock in the afternoon, four o'clock in the afternoon, something like that. A lot of utilities are worried about that as they should be. When you institute a program to save energy, energy efficiency, there's something called uh, demand response. So demand response is basically a program where you sign up and the utility, if it calls an event, that utility can shut down, cur curtail your load. You can shut off your air conditioner and you know you get maybe get paid from the utility to, to do this and be okay with that happening. But basically they want to be able to say like, oh man, it's going to be really, uh, it's going to be a really big day. We need to like curtail a little bit of load. So we focus on the peak. What if we didn't have to focus on the peak on one day? What if I was able to take all of the hours of the entire summer and try to analyze where I should target that energy efficiency program to save the most electricity? Not just that one hour. Um, is that because you could store it now? Not necessarily. That's, um, that's a bigger question for like a, from a distribution perspective. So what is the optimal way of servicing my end uses? But it I know we're now getting into the energy nitty yeah. gritty, yeah. but if you still have to manage to that one peak over the summer, that's the, traditionally, the generation capacity is 2x the average need. So if you still have to get to that one peak for one hour, you still need that 2x capacity. Right, well there's something called reliability. and So the, the, um, the electricity grid is set up a little bit interestingly. Half of it's kind of deregulated. So you got the utility, which is, regulated, right? They're regulated by the CPUC in California, or a basic uh, public utilities commission. But the generation not, is not necessarily regulated. There's something called Cal ISO in California. It's oh. an independent system operator. They're worried about reliability. They're charged with making sure that there is enough capacity to meet demand at any moment in time uh, during the summer. Oh, and if that moment is smaller, 
the reliability demand is less. You can bring that margin down. You don't need to be 2x. If you were really sure that the number was going to be this, you could bring it down to this and still have a uh, okay. adequate reliability. So, so back to why you're here. Yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> um, that's yeah, because I mean, you, you like you said, you're, you're dealing maritime, you're doing oil and gas, not just energy, business assurance. I mean, what is Spark doing for all of your clients, not just the energy guys, yeah. but for all of your clients now in terms of streamlining their processes and get, helping them make better decisions and I guess ultimately mitigating risk? Yeah, I mean, this whole, this whole set of few days has been pretty impressive, I gotta admit. I have learned more about how Spark is completely integrated into every enterprise platform you can think of. Everybody is somehow leveraging the strengths of Spark. I think everybody's kind of come to terms with, it's really good at this. It may not be as good at that, as what I want it to be in the future, but still, I can, you know, low hanging fruit. I can put Spark on my stack, on whatever analytics platform you have, and immediately you see gains. One of our use cases, we did, uh, I did a use case, where it was just pure data manipulation, nothing, no analytics. It took me 23 hours to do this job on, our, on one of our legacy servers. It took me seven minutes in uh, using Spark. And like, I, I, I don't know about any other use case. I think that's probably the greatest efficiency gain that I've ever heard of right. uh, with Spark. And you know, stuff like, something like that, if, if anything even close to that was able to be planted within each stack of each one of our business units, we would be able to, like I said, answer questions that we didn't even know existed, so. Right. So, when you go back, I mean, what are you going to put into practice, or, what, or what, what do you want to explore, well, you know, from, from what you've learned here, from what you've seen other people are doing, and how that would be applicable to what, what you want to do for your clients? Right, I think, um, same thing with low-hanging fruit, right? So, we, we're certainly not going to just get rid of everything we have, and everything we do, and just go full production spark, that's the deal. Spark complements what we do. As it stands, we don't have projects that justify uh, going full-blown Spark, right? We have a few mega projects where I'm dealing with like hundreds and hundreds of gigabytes of data, and even that's not even that big when we talk about big data. But for us, I mean, 100, 500 gigabytes of data is kind of hard to deal with uh, in most platforms. So for us, we're going to complement our current services with Spark. So Spark and other big data platforms, we're going to, hey, if you got a huge job, we've got a platform that can handle it. Going forward, um, I actually have this vision about what we could do, and it's it's pretty incredible. I mean, we could go from real-time forecasting, so I could know in real time. I could stream smart meter data into Spark and estimate forecasting models so that I know almost instantly what the electricity demand is going to be at any structure that I have data for in, in almost real time. That's not what we're doing now, for sure. But that is definitely something that, that's a great use case for where we see the energy industry going forward, so. So, in, in, that, um, in that scenario, would you need to get behind the, the meter itself down to the household devices? Or is the meter, would the meter be a good proxy for the more detailed analysis that you might have done historically? Yeah, one of the, that's a great question, and this is kind of a great shameless plug for something we're doing. Uh, DNVGL is probably, we're doing one of the biggest end use studies in the world, and kind of what we were talking in the beginning. There's this technology called non-intrusive load metering. Basically, I do not even need to go into the household. This is a machine learning uh, tool. I, I can put this device outside of your household on your smart meter, and it measures. The type of energy that you're consuming Pretty much. And associates that with the appliance or the device? It actually, it registers a change of 100 watts. So anytime it goes up or down by 100 watts, it registers as an event. And that event gets recorded over and over and over again. We take that whole log of events, we use a machine learning algorithm, and we smash it up against a library of known end uses. And we, we cat, we, it's a categorization problem. So we say like, okay, you know, these events happen, that looks like an air conditioner. These events happen, that looks like a dishwasher. So without even going into the home, you said behind the meter, I can go up to your meter right now, put this device on it, and I will know how much electricity you're using with, you know, with a little bit of uh, erring on the side yeah. of caution, uncertainty, yeah. What, what, what end uses are actually coming from that? That's interesting, because unintrusive. 
non low, yeah. low, low investment. All right, so kids, turn off the lights. <laughs> John Farland said turn yeah. off the lights. When you're not home. Thanks for being with us. And um, like I said, we think you've got a pretty cool job. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, very it's appreciative. Thank you yeah, very much. Yeah, DNVGL. Yeah, all right. And John Farland. All right. Back with more from San Francisco here on theCUBE in just a moment.